All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for a trip to the Greek islands with the traveling librarian. So we're joined by uh, Jeff Klapes, who's the uh, traveling librarian for another of his popular presentations, his popular armchair travel presentations. Uh, his series highlights travel photography and stories and travel tips about destinations around the world. Uh, so today we're going to visit two of Greece's 6,000 islands. Uh, one is popular and touristy, uh, the other much less so, but each with its own personality. We'll see countless churches, whitewashed villages, secluded beaches, and eat delicious Greek food. And so Jeff is the retired reference uh, librarian at um, the Lucius Beebe Memorial Library in Wakefield, and he's an avid traveler and photographer. I again want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. So all 150 plus of us who are watching live and those that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jeff for joining us this morning. And Jeff, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, everyone, for joining me today to visit my favorite country. Um, I'm actually, before we start, I'm just going to put in the chat um, my email address, um, because uh, anyone who has any questions after the program, do feel free, um, or comments, feel free to email me, and I'll uh, try to answer them as best I can. Um, but as Robert said, during this program, uh, Feel free as we're going through the program to pop questions into either the chat or the Q&A, and I'll try and answer them as we go along. And uh, anything I miss, I'll, we'll stick around at the end to take questions at the end of the program as well. So I'm going to share my screen now, and we'll get started. Um, and there we go. Okay. So... Um, this seems to be a good program to do today, given that those of you who are in Massachusetts know that we've had an incredibly rainy summer um, and it's pouring rain again today and cold. Um, so it's a good day to go to Greece. I was in Greece um, just this past month and for pretty much two straight weeks, there was not a cloud in the sky. Um, so it's been very different to come back home. Um, but I want to show you two places that I think even if you know Greece, you may not know these areas very well. I've been to a number of Greek islands, um, including all the famous ones that uh, we'll talk about in a minute. But I wanted to share with you two today that are not as frequently visited to give you a little better idea of what Greece has to offer. These are two islands that I visited last fall when I was there. Um, and I'm going to point them out on the map to, to you. The first one we're going to visit is called Kithira, which is a large island off the southern coast of the Peloponnese. And um, the second is called Idra, and it's much closer to Athens, um, which makes it a little bit more popular and touristy. And they have very different personalities, um, and I hope you'll see that as we go through. Uh, Kithira is pretty close to uh, where we have a house in Greece. My house is actually right about here um, on the Mani Peninsula uh, in the very southern part of the Peloponnese, and we can easily see Kithira from our house when the weather is clear. You'll see that in a minute. I do want to talk a little bit about the, how uh, Greeks, Greece, I, Greece's islands are organized or grouped. Uh, Idra is part of the Saronic group, which is the ones here in red, um, in the Saronic Gulf, um, close to Athens. Um, and Kithira is part of uh, the Ionian group, which, even though technically it's not in the Ionian Sea, um, but that incorporates all of the islands kind of down the far west coast of Greece uh, in the Ionian Sea facing towards Italy. The most, that the best known of those is Corfu, uh, way up uh, towards uh, Albania. The islands that you're probably most familiar with and the ones that you, if, if you see a travel guide to Greece or an article about Greece, um, almost invariably, you will see pictures of the Kikladis, which are the orange islands here. They're called the Kikladis because um, historically they were considered to revolve in a circle around the sacred island of Vilos, which is kind of in the middle here. Um, and that's why they get that name. Um, two of the most visited islands in Greece are in, in the Kikladis, Santorini um, and Mykonos, which are extremely touristy. In fact, uh, they're getting a bit over-touristed. Um, 
but uh, they have kind of the image of the Greek islands uh, with the whitewashed houses and the very barren landscapes and the beautiful cliffs and the little blue domed churches. But all of the other islands that I'm showing you on this map here have very different personalities. Um, so it's worth it to try to see other areas as well. The other big island group is called the um, Dodecanisos. Uh, over here, Rhodes is, is the best known of those. Um, it's called that because it's kind of based on the idea that there are 12 main islands in that group, Dodeca. Um, there's also the Northern Aegean Islands, the Northern Sporades Islands, so all of these different groups um, have, they, they kind of go together um, in these groups. And then of course there's Crete, which stands on its own as the largest island um, and is kind of almost not considered an island because it's so large. Um, I haven't actually been to Crete and hope to get there someday. Um, so we're gonna start with Kithara, which I should just point out just by way of uh, talking a little bit about the Greek language. Um, most place names in Greece are uh, feminine. Greece uses masculine, feminine, and neuter um, in its nouns, and the majority of place names tend to be uh, tend to be feminine. But that's not entirely true. There are quite a few masculine named places, and there's a handful, including Kitha, which are plural, um, kind of the way we might talk about the Bronx or the Philippines or the Bahamas, places like that that are uh, group. But Kifer is just a single island, but it's plural. Um, and it's easily reached by ferry from either the port of Ethio up here or the port of Neapoli. This is about one hour, that's about two hours. Um, I'm also gonna point out the island of Antikithera, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later, which is uh, quite a bit uh, distance, about halfway between that and Crete, which you can see down at the bottom of the slide. Um, it is clearly visible from our house on the Peloponnese on the mainland, even though it's about 30 miles away, you can see it here. This is the view from our porch. Um, and you can see Kithara clearly um, off in the distance. Um, it's even better on a, when the weather is really clear. There is a lighthouse, which we will visit at the very northern tip. Um, and I can easily see that at night flashing off in the distance. Um, the island itself is about 18 miles long roughly 12 miles wide. It's about the size of Martha's Vineyard, give or take. Um, but it only has about 4,000 people. And it is definitely one of the less touristed islands in Greece, um, which made it a delightful place to visit, particularly in the fall, which is kind of the shoulder off season. So um, it was not very crowded at all when we were there. And uh, the ferry that we took runs from Ethio, which is about an hour away from us. Um, Ethio is the ancient port of Sparta. Uh, Sparta is inland, about an hour or so inland from the coast, um, and Ethio was historically, and even today to some degree, um, the, the port connected with the, the ancient uh, city-state of Sparta. It's considered the capital of the East Mani region, even though it's only got a handful of people, maybe mm, 5,000 people or so, five or 6,000 people. It's a very pretty port town, and the ferry leaves from there. And it goes right past this little island, which is actually um, now connected to the mainland by a causeway. And I mentioned this island only because um, it actually has a very important place in Greek history or Greek mythology, where um, uh, Paris and Helen, when he took, he and Helen um, left the palace of um, Menelaus and kicked off the Trojan War by ticking everybody else off. And before they left um, mainland Greece and sailed east to Troy, they stayed overnight and shacked up on this little island, supposedly. It makes a great story. Um, these are just some views leaving the harbor of Ethio and past the little lighthouse on the island. When you arrive at uh, Kithara, it takes about two hours or so to get there. Um, you come to the port town, which is called the Akofti. It's a very sleepy little village. And the ferry uh, landing is on this island that you can see just off the coast, um, now connected by a causeway. Off in the distance, you might be able to see a little bit of land off in the haze, and that is called Vatica, which is the easternmost of the three big peninsulas that hang down like fingers um, from the south of the Peloponnese. 
Um, in addition to the ferries, Keithita also has a small airport, so technically it's um, possible to fly there, but it's a lot easier to take the ferry. Uh, it's a little disturbing to arrive at the ferry port and see a shipwreck, the first thing that you see when you arrive there. Um, this little islet has this shipwreck that's peeking out um, on the left, which is actually pretty recent. It was only about 20 years ago. Um, it's a ship that ran aground because um, the entire crew got, got drunk and hit the island. Um, now it's a popular um, uh, scuba diving spot, but it's a little disconcerting to see that as you're pulling in on the ferry. Um, here's the water, which in much of Greece, and uh, particularly in the Gulf of Laconia, which is where Kithera is located, is really beautiful. Crystal clear water, you can see all the way down to the bottom, which makes it great for swimming and diving. We stayed in a very uh, tiny little village, even tinier than the port, called uh, Avlemonas, um, and we're right on the ocean. There's very little in this village. Um, uh, except probably the only real sight to see in the village is this interesting old Venetian uh, port, uh, fortress right along the port, uh, which was built in 1565, back when this was actually an important port back in those days. But other than that, there's very little to do there. Here I am just sitting on our terrace with a book, enjoying the view, and here's the view. Um, we're going to explore the island a little bit more, but uh, sometimes it's just nice to sit around and look at the world around you with a drink. Um, this is evening in the village. This is about as exciting as Avlamonas gets. Um, everybody just kind of hangs around the one little shop and chats and talks about the news of the day. Um, it's actually, there, there's an important historical connection though to this village because um, I'm sure some of you have followed the story of the Elgin marbles, the Parthenon marbles um, that are now located in the British Museum in London. And there's been 200 years of controversy over the fact that um, Lord Elgin really should not have taken them. Um, and it would be nice if Britain gave them back um, to Greece. And I won't get into all the arguments about um, pro and con about that. Um, but the connection to this tiny little village is that after Lord Elgin um, and his crew stripped the Parthenon of many of these sculptures um, to sail them back to England, um, one of the ships sank in a storm um, and uh, very close to this particular village. And it was eventually salvaged two or three years later, but it took quite a while to do that. Um, and so this port actually got kind of known because there was a lot of activity during that time period, 200 years ago, when they were trying to resurrect the ship and, um, and all of its precious cargo. Here's a little uh, interesting little chapel. Uh, Kithera has churches all over it as um, is common throughout Greece, and I'm going to show you a few of those. And here's the lovely sunset view across the bay. Um, right above Avlemonas, this little village, is the highest point on the island. It's about 1,100 feet or so. Um, and you can either hike, which is kind of strenuous, or you can drive. Um, and if you get all the way to the top, there are these two little churches with spectacular views in all directions, a lot of peace and quiet and a lot of goats um, and not much else. Here's one of the churches and also way up on the hill behind, you can't really see it. Um, and there's not much to see at this point, but this was back in the Minoan era, um, an important religious sanctuary. Um, so there was actually a sanctuary on top of this hill, highest point on the, on the island. Now there's really nothing left but the ruins of a Minoan watchtower, but it does make um, for a nice hike. And the views back down to the village that we stayed in um, are quite something. You can clearly see actually right here is the fort that I showed you in the earlier picture um, at the entrance to the harbor. Kithara is also known for really beautiful beaches, many of which are isolated and secluded, and you'll probably be completely alone there unless you're there at the height of summer. Um, this is just a few miles southwest from where we were on a beach called Kaladi. And you just take a long stone stairway down the sea. Um, many of uh, the beaches in Greece are not sand, the nice soft sand that we're used to here in New England, um, but are in fact pebble beaches. Um, and they're very nice. It's just kind of a different atmosphere. 
Greece does have plenty of sand beaches as well, but they're definitely not as common as they are here. And the white pebble beaches certainly have their charm. This one, we were we were the only people there <laughs> when we went, um, except for a bunch of goats. Um, and it's fun to explore these beaches because the rock formations are um, quite interesting and there's always lots of caves and archways. Um, this particular beach is actually two beaches. If you sneak through the little archway, um, you can find yourself in the other beach around the corner. And you'll pretty much have the place to yourself unless you're there during July and August. Um, we were there in late October, early November when the weather in southern Greece is still quite nice. Um, the weather is beautiful. It's clear. It's a lot less hot um, than it is during the height of summer. Um, and the prices are cheaper and there are far fewer tourists. I'm a big fan of goats, so that's another reason Greece is one of my favorite countries because hardly a day goes by when you don't see goats. Um, I need to talk about this little rock that you can see off in the distance. This is called the egg, Tavgo, which is off the very southern tip um, of Kifira Island. And it is supposedly, according to mythology, where the goddess Aphrodite was born, Aphrodite in Greek. Um, she was born from the waves on a clamshell or a scallop shell, I forget. Um, and this is the location where that supposedly happened. Um, after that, she skimmed over the waves and ended up in Crete, uh, which also claims her um, uh, as its birthplace. And not far from that, at the very southern tip of the island, is the town of Hora, or Kithera town, which is, uh, well, it's the capital, such as it is. It's still a very small town. But it's perched up very high over the ocean, um, and you can see on the left uh, the castle, which um, was the fortification for the town, and it spills on the hillside behind it. Um, it is uh, perched way up high over a small harbor, which I'll show you in a sec, right here. Um, this little village is called Kapsali. Um, it's become just a nice little beach resort. It has a beautiful little beach in the middle and a lighthouse and a lot of seafood restaurants. Um, but it's definitely not over-touristed. You won't find any major resorts or high-rises or anything like that on Kithara. It's a very um, relaxed um, comfortable island that's uh, the kind of place where you, if, if you want nightlife, if you want fancy beach bars and loud music and lots of shopping, Kithara is not for you. <laughs> if you want peace and quiet um, and just a nice place to explore, then this is the place to go. It's a close-up of the lighthouse, which was built by the English um, in the 1850s. We're going to talk a little bit more about the British because um, they occupied the island for quite some time in the 19th century um, and left their mark um, in a number of places. This is the town, the capital, um, and it's mostly pedestrianized, which is nice. So you have all the little narrow uh, cobbled lanes, and it definitely has the feeling of an Aegean island, which uh, the Kiklades Islands, like I mentioned before, even though technically this is part of the Ionian group of islands, which tend to be a little bit more green and lush um, than the Aegean islands. Um, Kithara is kind of a mix. It's close to the Peloponnese mainland, but the style of architecture really is quite a bit more like, um, like that of the Kiklades Islands. Um, you can explore the castle uh, up at the top of the hill uh, that has a couple of very nice churches and a beautiful view back to the town and some fantastic architecture. Um, those of you who've come to my programs before know that um, uh, I studied architecture in my undergraduate years and so that's one of the things I tend to look for when I travel and there's some very striking architecture in Greece. This is an unusual uh, uh, whitewashed church that was within the um, castle ramparts. And just outside was this uh, incredible modern building that just almost looks like a, a modern sculpture. The town is very sleepy. Um, and even the main square, which is where most of the activity is, it's just a nice place to stop and have a drink. We had breakfast there. 
it's there's some shops um, and it does get busy during the summer, but it's definitely not one of the more touristy islands. Um, so if you want a little bit more of the feel of uh, relaxed Greece, this is a good place to go. Uh, there's a number of beautiful chapels that cling to the hillside below the below the castle. And this this photo doesn't immediately look like something interesting, but I want you to see. I'm not sure how well you can see. Um, but right here, there's something that's just a little bit darker. Um, and that's 24 miles away. Um, and that is the much smaller island of Antikythera. Um, which is famous for the Antikythera mechanism, which I'll show you just next. There are no hotels there. There are no restaurants. Um, if you go there, um, the ferries go about, I think, twice a week, um, even during high season. It's not an easy place to get to. And if you go, basically, you're going to end up staying in someone's house. Um, if, I have not been, and I hope to eventually go there because it does sound, I love the idea of very remote islands. There's only about 30 residents. But the reason it's famous is for this unusual little object. This is the Antikythera mechanism, which was found in a shipwreck just offshore of the island in 1901. It's now in the Archaeological Museum in Athens. And um, it's estimated to be from about the first or second century BC. And it's an incredibly complicated astronomical mechanism with, um, I believe, 37 uh, gears that operate in different ways. On the right is a reconstruction, a modern reconstruction of what they think the Antikythera mechanism was would have been like. Um, the exhibit in, in the museum is quite good at explaining what they think it was used for. Um, and the, the big thing about it is just, this is an extremely old mechanism. It's made of uh, metal, and yet it's incredibly complicated for something that is, you know, over 2000 years old. Um, and you'll find uh, plenty of information online about it if you want to read more. Um, here is a view of the uh, looking from the castle back out over the town. And within the castle, there are in the enclosure of the castle, there's a number of uh, separate churches. There's even a nice little museum. And you can look down at all these beautiful little cliff chapels. This is another one kind of across the valley above the um, Kapsali Beach Resort. Um, it was closed when we were there, um, but you can still climb up. Um, it's St. John on the Cliff for obvious reasons. This is what it looks like to get up to it, but we couldn't get inside. Um, and very close to it is another uh, interesting church. It's one of three cave churches on the island that are dedicated to St. Sophia. Uh, this one is actually not terribly old but it's very atmospheric. Um, and even though the church itself isn't old, it was um, when archeological uh, surveys were done there, they think that uh, there is evidence of the human use of the cave way back several thousand years. Um, and the cave actually goes quite a distance into the mountain with stalactites and stalagmites and all of that. But um, the church itself is, is a 20th century chapel that's much more recent. Um, but it's it's quite an atmospheric place to be. Um, I do always have to talk about food in these presentations. So here is um, lunch, um, some nice grilled octopus, which is one of my favorites. And in the middle is a delicious beet salad. Um, there's a lot of different recipes for beet salad. Um, so I like trying different ones. They usually are served with garlic and olive oil, sometimes with um, yogurt and maybe a little vinegar. Um, behind it, the greens are just stewed greens. There's a variety of different greens along the lines of spinach, again, served with olive oil, lemon juice, garlic, salt and pepper. Very simple food, but delicious. Um, and on the right is a wonderful homemade Greek, uh, fish soup uh, with a bottle of retzina, which is one of my favorite Greek wines. Exploring a little bit more of the island, one of the big sites is called the Katuni Bridge, which was built by the British when they were occupying the island in the 18, uh, 19, uh, 1800s. This was built in the 1820s and is strikingly odd for a Greek island. Um, the British captured these islands, the Ionian islands that, that stretch along the, the western coast of Greece. They captured it from the French in 1809 
And then they ruled all of those islands for about 50 years before they officially became part of the modern um, independent nation of Greece. And this bridge is quite, quite impressive. Um, and in fact, all over the island, you'll find reminders of that British period, um, including things like this, this old Gothic school building, which is now abandoned, but could easily be somewhere in the British Isles. The more traditional architecture that you'll see in uh, in Kithera is this local style with these funny little cylindrical chimneys that have little conical hats on top. And even the more modern houses that are built um, currently uh, are often built in that same traditional style. So this is not an old an old house by any means, but um, it's trying to look in that same style. There's also countless churches all over the island. And even if you don't, even if you're not really into church history, it's worth it to visit a number of them because um, they are usually quite old um, and often have spectacularly beautiful interiors. This one is probably my favorite church, I think, that I've seen in all of the islands uh, that I've visited. This is Ayos Dimitrios in, uh, near a little village called Purco. Uh, it's one of the most unusual churches in the Aegean. Um, partly because of its roof style, which is very typical for Kithera, that sort of swooping um, organic look to it. It's a 13th century church um, and actually four churches built onto each other. It has one entrance, but once you get inside, there are four different parts of the church that were tacked on over the centuries, um, each one dedicated to a different saint. This is a little bit of what it looks like inside. Um, each church kind of merges weirdly into the others. And there are a few um, frescoes. These are about 700 years old, still visible in the church. And they still use it. The local villagers still do celebrate um, services in the church and um, festivals throughout the year. But this roof style, I, I just found fascinating. It's a very typical uh, roof style for buildings in Kithera. Here's another church um, in the south of the island, very odd looking. It's in the middle of nowhere. We had to hike quite a ways to get to it. Um, this is to St. Myron. Um, and it has this weird gigantic buttress that keeps it basically keeps it from sliding down the hill. And another completely different kind of weird church. This is to St. John the, uh, the Theologian, way high up on a hill, um, far from the far from the sea. And it's fortified, it almost looks like a castle, and that's because it was specifically designed to be a watchtower to look for pirates. Um, many of the villages in uh, the islands and on the mainland Peloponnese were not originally built on the coast as they are today, because um, nowadays people are much more interested in beach vacations, but 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and in other previous centuries, piracy was a much bigger concern. So they didn't go to the beach. They built way up in the mountains, um, which was um, much more protected and allowed them up high to be able to survey the area around them. So you can actually climb all the way to the top of this watchtower. Here I am clambering up to the top. And when you get there, there's a spectacular view over the rest of the island, um, looking back to the village that we stayed in. Um, and also those uh, that highest point that I mentioned that has a couple of churches on it. The landscape around uh, the, particularly the interior of Kithera is very nice. It's it's greener than you might expect and has some very pretty valleys. Um, this is one with a fun um, road cut into the, uh, the cliffs with archways and stuff that leads to the west coast where there is a beautiful monastery complex called Yaramomi Panagia Mirtidiotisa Kithiron. Um, this is the patron saint of the island. It's the Virgin Mary of the myrtles, the myrtle plants, um, because in the 12th century, a miraculous icon was found here on this location. Although most of the monastery that you can see now, the buildings that exist today, are really more from the 19th century. It's been rebuilt over the years. But it has a stunning Orthodox church with beautiful decorations. Um, and quite a large complex of gardens and um, other buildings that include um, 
uh, the refectory and the dormitories for the monks and so forth, and a very nice tall bell tower, which is separate from the church. Um, and not far from that, right on the coast, uh, the monastery is a couple miles inland, but if you go all the way to the coast, um, there's this tiny chapel of Ayos Nikolaos Krasats. And uh, Krasi is the Greek word for wine. And the legend says that this particular church was constructed in the 17th century. In 1619, there was a ship carrying a lot of wine, um, and it got caught in a storm. And they prayed to St. Nicholas and were safe um, on the island. So they built this chapel in thanks to St. Nicholas. So it's named for him, dedicated to him. And according to the legend, instead of using water uh, for the mortar that, to build the church, they used wine. Whether or not any of this is true, who knows? But it makes for a wonderful story. And um, it's, it's the origin of the name of the church. Um, but... Aside from that, it's just a spectacular location. Um, on a clear day, you would actually be able to see our house off in the distance, but you can't quite see that here. Um, not far away from here is another of the important spots to visit um, on the island called Milopotamos, to the little village. Milopotamos means river of mills. And uh, in a normal year, it was very dry when we were there, it's this this little glen, um, a little valley, hidden valley almost, um, has a number of mills. And you, there's a beautiful hiking trail that you can walk from one mill to the other. And it's cool. And uh, you can hear the sound of trickling water. When we were there, it was completely dry. So we didn't actually get to enjoy any of that. Um, but uh, it still makes for a very pleasant hike. Um, and the village is lovely. It has some beautiful churches, um, some nice little tavernas to eat lunch in. Um, and some interesting ruins. If you work your way down through the village, um, through some of the, um, the little side streets, um, you will come to the big attraction, which is the ruined set settlement of a town called Katohora, Lower Town, which was um, an important Venetian fortress. The Venetians um, were another one of the many cultures that held sway over uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and this part of Greece um, back in the 1500s. So they built a large fortified settlement here. Uh, here's the entrance. And in fact, here um, you can see the main gate with the Lion of Venice, the Lion of St. Mark, um, right over the main entrance. It was actually inhabited up until the 1950s, but now it's completely abandoned. Uh, most of the buildings are in ruins or getting there. Uh, but there are numerous houses that you can explore, as well as nine churches, um, some of which still have vis visible frescoes. And um, a major part of uh, visiting this village is the amazing view. The reward for working your way all the way through the village is that when you get down to the very tip, um, you're at the entrance to this gorge um, that looks out towards the west um, to the sea. In fact, way off in the distance, you can see the peninsula where our house is just barely hidden in the, in the mists. Um, but you can also see a number of the very precariously perched houses and churches with some of those curved roofs, um, typical of the island style with slate here. Uh, there's another church across the valley. This is a 17th century church to St. Marina of the Waters. Uh, and again, another view out over it. You can see how this would be a very good place to build a protected, um, fortified town uh, because you can easily see out to the ocean. It's protected on three sides by massive cliffs. Um, so it's very safe from pirates. Um, just a this is just a picture of some of the local plant life. I believe, I had to look this up, but um, this plant grows all over the area where we are in Southern Greece. And I think it's a kind of euphorbia, which we don't really have here in the US. Um, 
the other place, this is on the opposite side of the island, but if you like ruins, uh, this is another fun place to explore. Paleochora, which means old town, um, is also a fortified settlement now in ruins. Um, and it's a little harder to get to because you have to hike there. It takes about an hour over this rocky path. But again, it's um, incredibly rewarding once you get there. This was another early castle town. Um, it was built uh, in the Byzantine era around the 12th century um, for the same reason that the other one was. It was very well protected. Um, there's a gorge that um, heads out to the east side of the island. It was originally called Ayos Dimitrios. And there's some beautiful old churches. Um, for a long time, it was the capital of Pithida. And there were, it was big enough that there were 70 houses within the fortress walls, 70 houses and no, no fewer than 23 different churches. Um, and here you can see the entrance and the cliffs surrounding it. Um, this is the main castle entrance um, at the only really accessible um, entrance to the, to the town. The rest all the way around all three sides is very steep cliffs. And uh, like, the, like the previous ruins that I showed you, there's an incredible landscape around it with um, the very steep gorge. This is looking back up the valley that you hike down and some gorgeous churches. And it's surprisingly lush for Greece. There's actually um, a good amount of, um, it's not New England lush or Southern, <laughs> Southern US lush. But for Greece, there's uh, a surprising amount of both evergreen and um, deciduous trees. Obviously, lots of olives are grown here as well. Um, it has a very Mediterranean climate. But the gorge is spectacular. It's several hundred feet deep and very, very narrow. Um, and if you curve around to the left, it works its way out to um, the sea on the eastern side of the island. It's also very precipitous. Um, I am afraid of heights, believe it or not. So it's, I've, I've gotten better at this over the years. The more times you climb up very dangerous things, you kind of get used to it after a while. Um, but on all, all, all sides, except that one entrance, there are uh, sheer drops all the way down to the little river uh, that heads east through the gorge to the sea. The sad part of this story, though, is that despite its really well-protected location, it was attacked um, in 1537 by Barbarossa, you might, have, might remember him, from the Ottoman fleet. And he sacked and completely destroyed the town. He leveled it, um, in, uh, massacred or enslaved all of the inhabitants. So since basically since the early 16th century, it has been abandoned. Um, so that's why it's, it has the feel of a ghost town now. Um, I love being there in the fall. I will be going back to Greece um, in October um, because it's, as I said, it's much more peaceful, quiet. The weather is beautiful and there's lots of wildflowers. Spring has plenty of wildflowers, but fall does as well, interestingly. Um, and these are all over southern Greece. These are called um, cyclamens, fall cyclamens. They're tiny. They're not like the ones that you buy in the flower shops. Um, and they grow all over Southern Greece um, in and around the rocks. Stopping for lunch again, have to have some more food. Here's a, a snack, some wine and grilled pork and vegetables on the beach. Looking out over the incredibly blue water. Um, at the very Northern tip, I mentioned at the beginning, there is a lighthouse. And this is another one of the remnants from the British uh, period. So this was built in 1857 by the British and it's one of the tallest, largest lighthouses in Greece. Um, as I said, we can easily see it from about 20, more than 20 miles away from our house. Um, we can see, see it flashing off in the distance. You can hike all the way to the very Northern tip. Um, where you can see pretty much the entire Gulf of Laconia. The land that you're seeing off in the distance is again the, the Vatica Peninsula, which is the, the easternmost of the um, peninsulas that stick down south from the Peloponnese. There's some goats very sensibly sitting in the shade. 
Um, the day we were getting ready to leave, um, we visited uh, another of the monasteries. This is one that's high above the port that you, the little port town that you come in on the eastern side of the islands is Haya Moni uh, Monastery. It has only two monks now, um, one of whom we met and gave us a very nice tour. Uh, it's an 18th century monastery, much more recent than some of the others. Um, and uh, much of this, what you see here, including the church and the bell tower, are even more recent than that. They're actually from the mid 19th century. But it's a beautiful place, way high up um, over the sea, with um, a painted iconostasis in the church, and this beautiful um, bell tower, and a number of very pretty. Uh, auxiliary buildings built in the typical Kithara style. And no shortage of goats, there's always goats. And even baby goats, which to me, baby goats are even better than regular goats. Um, here back down, the, the monastery is way up on this hill here. Can't quite see it in this picture. Um, this is the ferry coming in, which in the off season, because we were there in the fall, during the summer, the ferries run more frequently. Um, but in the fall, it runs twice a week. And um, this is the ferry boat coming in to pick us up. And one of the many little chapels that you can see on the ferry as you head back um, to the main town, uh, Yithio. It's about, like I said, it's about a two hour ferry ride. And if you're um, if you're taking if you're just going as a pedestrian, um, the ferry rides are actually pretty cheap. Um, if you're taking a car, it's slightly more expensive, but not outrageously so. Um, and actually, I'm just checking the. Um, I should be looking paying more attention to the to the chat. Um, someone was asking, "How did you get around the island? Did I rent a car?" And and yes, you really um, uh, you can take cars on the ferry, and um, Kithara is large enough that you really do need a car to get around. Um, there are uh, there is a bus system on the island, but um, public transport in a place like that is pretty limited. So unless you have tons and tons of time, I don't think I would want to rely on the bus system uh, because you suck up a lot of your time uh, just traveling. Um, so it's well worth it to take a car, I think, instead, um, particularly if you want to explore a lot of the things that I've showed you, like the beaches and these weird little churches off in the middle of nowhere, are not readily accessible by the bus system. So um, a, a car, I think, is pretty necessary if you go there. Um, there is um, There are guidebooks, although Kithara is not usually um, very well represented in the big guidebooks that um, publishers that you may know of, um, but there are a couple of good um, locally printed guidebooks that you can buy on the island or through Amazon Kindle and things like that that um, have a lot more detail about um, uh, about the specifics around the island. And let's see. Uh, so now we're back in uh, uh, Piraeus, which is the main port of Athens and one of the busiest shipping ports in all of Europe. Most people don't bother to see it except to get on their cruise ship. <laughs> if there are um, a huge number of people going to Greece, just fly into Athens, spend a day or two seeing the Acropolis, and then they rush down to Piraeus to get on their mega cruise ship and go to Santorini and Mykonos and maybe some other place and go home. Um, and that's a shame because Piraeus is a wonderful city. It's, it's actually a separate part of Athens and quite large. Um, it's the ancient port of Athens. Um, but it's also a very nice modern city. It doesn't have quite the, the historic ruins um, that central Athens does, but it has some beautiful sea, seafront promenades, very nice beaches, a number of marinas, um, and some just nice neighborhoods. This is one of the main churches. There's a park in the center that has a very nice municipal theater, another of the major churches. Um, but the big thing about Piraeus, of course, is that it's the main uh, cruise port and ferry port for Athens. And so the second island that we're visiting today is called Ivra, um, and it's one of the Saronic Islands, um, named after the Saronic Gulf, which is this body of water here um, in between Athens and the Peloponnese. 
Um, you can take a ferry uh, from Athens. It stops at the island of Poros and then comes around the corner to Idra and takes barely two hours um, to get there. And it's, uh, Idra is a popular enough island that there are many, many uh, trips. In fact, I think at least two or three a day, perhaps even more during the summer. Um, this, uh, the other islands in this area are Egina, which is even uh, more visited because it takes barely an hour to get there from Athens, even makes a nice day trip. Salamina is less visited because it's a little bore and there, there's more military stuff on the island. But Salamina, you probably heard of, better known as Salamis um, in English because it's the island where the Greeks defeated the Persians um, as underdogs in a very important naval battle uh, in 480 BC, in this, um, where the, uh, the Persian fleet was destroyed in this narrow little um, strait in between Salamina and the, and the mainland. But Idra is off the, um, off the coast of this peninsula here on uh, the Peloponnese. And here's a close up of it. It's about 13, 12, 13 miles long and maybe five miles or so from the mainland. You can also reach it from the town of Ermioni, uh, which is a little bit closer. Um, there's really only one sizable town on the island, which is the town of Idra. And the thing that makes Idra different from a lot of the other islands that you might visit is that um, it's fairly small. There are no vehicles allowed on the island, no cars. You cannot take a car there. You don't really need a car there. Um, there are... Um, with the exception of a very small number of garbage trucks. There are no motorized vehicles on the island at all. There's not even any bicycles, although I suppose you could, but um, you'd be crazy to because it's not a bicycle-friendly kind of island because it's very mountainous. Um, it's only about 2,000 people, um, but it's, it tends to be very touristed because it's so accessible. Um, and as you'll see, it's one of the more beautiful islands uh, to visit. There's a number of very fast, both fast and slow uh, catamarans that go there. Greece has extensive ferry connections to most of its islands, um, both with slow ferries and fast ones, um, less so in the off season. Um, but either even in the off season is well visited enough that um, it's definitely not hard to get to. Here's an even more space age ferry uh, than the one I took. The name Idra, um, you've probably heard of the Hydra, um, the ancient monster that um, Hercules had to cut off his head, uh, cut off the monster's heads and he kept growing new ones. Um, the island is not actually named for that. It is named for um, the springs uh, on the island. And the ancient Greek word for water um, is very similar to either, hydro, like hydrological, for example, um, our modern word. So that's actually where the, uh, the name of the island comes from. I arrived at night um, and the small port is just lovely, uh, all lit up at night. And again, there's no traffic, so it's a very quiet, atmospheric place. This is the hotel I stayed in, uh, very comfy, right on the harbor in the middle of things uh, with balconies where you could sit in the afternoon and watch people come and go with a drink and some snacks. Um, this particular hotel, um, the Sofia, I'd recommend because they had a fabulous homemade breakfast buffet. Um, it, it was more of a guest house. With, it only has four or five rooms and everybody eats together. And I made some very nice friends while I was there. And we'd all get together for breakfast in the morning and have this sumptuous breakfast with all homemade goodies. Um, looking down from above, you can see the, the waterfront has a number of different cafes and restaurants. Um, and here's my hotel right near the church. Um, the highlight of the island is just the beautiful town, uh, which is arranged like an amphitheater on the hills around the harbor. And because there are no motorized vehicles, uh, this is looking out my hotel window, um, you'll see donkeys everywhere. That's really the main means of transport. There are no cars, there's no noisy motorcycles. Um, walking is the easiest way to get around. And if you can't walk or it's difficult to walk, you can, or if you have a lot of stuff to carry, you can take a donkey. Um, Greece obviously also has ubiquitous cats everywhere in Greece. 
lots of them in Ibiza. Um, here are some more views of the harbor. It is a working port, so there's fishing uh, going on. There are lots of um, uh, recreational boats that will take you on tours around the island and plenty of cafes. If you look back from the entrance to the harbor, you can see how incredibly picturesque it is, which is why it's one of the most popular islands, um, especially in the summer, because uh, it's relatively easy for people to get to um, from Athens, including lots of Greeks. Um, it's it's touristed by others as well, but it's it's so easy for Greeks to take a quick uh, day trip or weekend trip away from the city uh, that it's very popular for that. It's surrounded by a number of other rocky islets, and the mainland of the Peloponnese is just visible only a few miles away. Um, you'll note there's an old windmill here as well. The houses creep up the hill, um, and all of them have tile roofs. And you'll notice that the style is quite different um, from the style that you might expect to see on Santorini, for example, or um, even on Kithera, where we just were. Um, this is a very neoclassical Venetian style. Um, this is a style that you'll see in um, a number of parts of Greece, particularly um, in on the Ionian Islands and some other areas that were heavily influenced by the Venetians. Um, this is a very nice local museum that has um, the archives. They have art exhibits and also mostly maritime history, um, but it's a very nice little spot to visit. And the buildings that you can see here, these kind of blocky ones heading out towards the, um, the ramparts at the fort, um, were used originally as quarantine stations during plagues in the past. Now they are used as cultural centers, so they have um, temporary exhibits that you can visit. And that fort that guards the harbor is a nice spot um, to get some beautiful views out over the surrounding area. That's the mainland off in the, um, in the distance, the Peloponnese. And way off in the background, those little white dots, those are the houses of uh, Hermione which is a nice little tourist town and also uh, one of the uh, big ferry ports in the northern Peloponnese to go to the islands in the area. This is the east side of the town uh, with the houses again sprinkled up and down the hillsides. And way up at the top, there's an old windmill that has now been converted into a guest house that you can stay in if you want something a little bit unusual. And the west side of the port with its um, fortified protective walls. And on this side, um, for some reason on this side, more so than on the Eastern side, there's a number of large mansions which were built by wealthy merchants um, in over the last two or 300 years. And a couple of them have been turned into nice museums. The water in the harbor, given all the shipping um, traffic is amazingly clear. Here's some typical mansions. Um, some of which are now um, used as guest houses, some are private homes. And there's no shortage of boats. Um, it's because there are very few roads um, and no vehicles allowed. Um, if you want to explore the distant parts of the island, particularly the secluded beaches that hide around the other coasts, uh, the best way to get there is to hire a boat that will take you there. And there's uh, no shortage of opportunities for that. You can also visit some of these um, isolated little rocks. This one has a chapel on it. Um, but you can also do a certain amount of exploring on your own. There are nice walks, uh, most of which are pretty flat if you don't wanna do any climbing. Um, in both directions from the main town, there are some very nice paved walkways that go several kilometers in either direction to visit some of the little villages. Um, I wouldn't even call them villages. They're more like little settlements. Um, this is um, a small one called Kamini, uh, where you can swim or sit <laughs> if you don't want to do anything else. That's what the locals do. You can see the path um, along the coastline. So there's nice views. It's, it's a paved walkway, so it's not difficult. 
And there are just lovely views along the coast. This is Paralia Vijos, another little cute cove where you can go swimming. Um, and I came across an old stone bridge. This is very typical of the Byzantine architecture in Greece. And every, oh God, every seems every 50 meters, you'll come across a church. This is Ayos Karalambos, which is just a cute little church right on the edge of the sea on a terrace built into the rocks. There was a regatta going on off the coast between us and the mainland. And you will see, of course, donkeys everywhere, um, not just for tourists. Um, the locals use them as well, because it is the main way to get around the island if you are carrying stuff or you don't feel like walking or you're climbing. And they are everywhere. Here is a view back um, to the main town, having walked a little bit, a couple of kilometers to the west. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anywhere in Greece, maybe Santorini that had as many cats as either of those. Um, in fact, you can't swing a cat without hitting another cat. So if you're a cat person, it's a good place to go. Um, the town is full of these typical little narrow pedestrian streets with the whitewashed houses piled on top of each other. Um, and most of them are cobbled like this. Here's one of the narrower streets. Lots of stairs also climbing up the hill. Um, uh, an important site, believe it or not, to visit in the village is the old historic pharmacy. Um, and next to it is the mansion that the, the family that started the pharmacy built um, immediately adjacent to it. Now it's a historic landmark. Um, I discovered interestingly that it's um, the owner who is seated here on the right um, happens to be a good friend of the father of one of my Greek teachers who lives here in, in uh, the Boston area. Um, she's originally from uh, Northern Greece and her father at some point, um, I don't remember how they met. Um, so I had a very nice chat with him since we had a, a personal connection and he gave me a tour of the pharmacy, which is um, still beautifully historic, except it's a modern pharmacy. You can go there now and buy, I bought suntan lotion and you can get your prescriptions filled there. Um, but uh, the Rafalia family founded it in 1890, and it looks pretty much the way it did way back then. Um, the current uh, owner is the grandson of the original founder of the store. It's a nice spot to, to visit. The waterfront, uh, that very small waterfront around the harbor, is full of cafes that are busy pretty much all day. Um, and the other sites that you might want to see if you have time um, this is one of the historic mansions that has been converted into a folk museum. Uh, Lazarus Kuntunriotis um, built this mansion in 1780. He was a wealthy ship owner. Lots of shipping went through Idra. And now uh, the museum has excellent displays of the original furnishings of the house and also a lot of decorative arts, not to mention a really nice view out over the harbor. Um, but you can see, visit a lot of the rooms that are decorated with furnishings from that time period, and you can see how a wealthy merchant family would have lived um, in that time period. Here's the kitchen. And they have some very nice displays of folk art with cost costumes from different time periods and different ethnic groups or um, uh, throughout, throughout Greece. Um, as well as things like ceramics and um, household things and maps and you name it. It's a, it's a fascinating little museum. And with your ticket to this museum, you also get to visit another one, um, which is smaller, but um, very different. This is a, a related museum of a famous Idriot painter. Um, and it shows you a, a typical, much more modest house. This is not a mansion, uh, a more, uh, ordinary sized house to give you an idea of what it would have been like to live again in mostly in the 19th century in a much more cozy but still very beautiful home. It's full of um, original antiques and this house originally also had a store attached to it and this shop is full of original merchandise um, so you can see how it would have 
been if you were to to shop there uh, 150 years ago. Um, there's also an art studio where the artist uh, who lived in the house worked, so you can see a number of his uh, original artworks and the studio where he painted. Um, here's some barrels where you could have bought um, alcoholic beverages back in the day. I should point out this is cognac, and this is mastica, which is a very delicious uh, liqueur that you can uh, drink. You can even buy it. Um, there's a few places in the U.S., uh, at least in the Boston area, some of the specialty shops where you can buy mastica. Um, it's made uh, on the island of Chios, which is actually quite far from here. It's way over on the Turkish coast um, in the northeast uh, Aegean. And mastica is made from the resin of a particular tree that grows on that island. And it has an unusual flavor. It's very hard to describe. It's kind of herbal, um, but it makes a very um, chewy resin. In fact, it's where we get the word masticate from, meaning to chew. Um, and you can chew on the resin. It's kind of hard, but you can also cook with it. And they turn it into, uh, they make soap out of it and colognes and um, most commonly into this liqueur that's flavored with it, which is quite delicious. Uh, many of the side streets in Idra have a number of little delicious restaurants that spill out into the streets. On the waterfront, you'll find mostly cafes rather than full restaurants. The restaurants are kind of tucked up the streets. Um, and we have to stop for food again. Um, here is some homemade moussaka, which is real Greek comfort food, um, and a salad, a nice light salad of greens and cabbage with a glass of wine and some homemade bread. Uh, being touristy, you can also buy a lot of junk in Idra, some of which is very nice and some of which is not so nice. Um, this store was on the ground floor of my hotel, but you can buy lots of reproductions and cheesy Greek statues, um, but also some very beautiful things um, uh, if you're interested. Um, I think the best thing to do on Idra is just to walk around to explore um, on foot. Um, if you're not ambitious, you can just hike along the coast, which is um, kind of low, low impact. Um, but if you want something a little bit more strenuous, you can walk all the way up to one of the highest points in the island, um, up these uh, rocky roads and, and paths, stairways up to uh, Profitis Ilias Monastery, which is about 1500 feet up. And it gives you a, an unparalleled view down back to the village, um, just a postcard view of the harbor um, and also the mountains that surround it. The reward, if you make it all the way to the top, um, is a very peaceful monastery complex with a beautiful church um, and a bell tower. It is the only male monastery on the island. I should point out that in Greek, the word for monastery encompasses both male and female um, uh, complexes, whereas in English, we, we think of a monastery as being mostly uh, male monks. And if it's females, uh, we, if it's women, we call it a nunnery. Um, but on either, there are several monasteries, and this is the only one that actually was male. The rest, the rest had only women. Um, and now it's down to only one monk. <laughs> it's the only one left which is true in many parts of Greece. The church is gorgeous. Um, the complex was established in 1813, so it's not as old as some of the other monasteries that um, we've already seen today. Uh, and it was very wealthy at one point in the 19th century and known for its library. Now it's just kind of a peaceful um, place to visit. Um, there's uh, the beautiful church and the bell tower. Um, but it's just a simple enclosure of very serene whitewashed buildings. Not too many people make it all the way to the top, so it's unlikely to be terribly crowded. Um, although you will see some cats and probably a bunch of goats as well. Um, another reward besides the building um, are the incredible views. This is looking west. Um, almost from the highest point of the island. So you can see all the way to um, the mainland of the Peloponnese um, and a number of the other 
um, islands in between, many of which are uninhabited, uh, those little ones. And the views from the top, particularly like I was lucky to have perfect weather when I was there. So the views looking back down to the harbor are, are incredible. The hike takes a good hour. I would plan at least an hour to get up um, or more, maybe even an hour and a half. Um, and you will definitely want water. Um, it's not a hard hike. Um, it's mostly, much of it is paved or has um, rocky steps, uh, stone steps, but it's pretty hard on the knees. So that's something to think about. Um, and definitely, particularly if it's if it's warm out, take water with you. This is looking east towards a couple of the islands, other monasteries that uh, we'll go by in a little bit. This is that same islet that we saw from down below, seen from way high up. And the backside of the town, if you come from behind all the way uh, from the monastery, you come down the backside to get a different view of the town. And some of the neighborhoods way up high um, are lovely because uh, they're so narrow. There are uh, the, the streets are barely narrow enough, uh, barely wide enough even for donkeys to get through. They're just um, these typical alleys and houses piled on top of each other until you get back down to the hustle and bustle of the port. There's even a cinema. Um, on the island and uh, they have some nice old movie ads in the windows. There were a number of important uh, films that were uh, that were filmed on the island um, because it is so beautiful and so accessible. There's time for lunch. Um, and the other good walk that you can take is the opposite direction towards the east from um, the main town that goes along the coast for oh, maybe a couple miles. Um, and you'll see some beautiful villas along the water, along with um, this interesting sculpture, which is by the very famous artist Jeff Koons. Um, this is a kinetic sculpture. Um, and there's an old slaughterhouse uh, right uh, by the side of the water that has been turned into an exhibition space uh, for art installations. Um, and then here is, can I get this to work? This is a video. Why can't I get my video to work? Oh, well, um, it spins. This, <laughs> uh, there's a face on both sides of this, um, and it silently spins uh, in the wind and is a wonderful kinetic sculpture. Oh, there it goes. And Along the way, there are, again, just tiny little settlements, nothing that even counts really as a village in its own right. Um, and some beautiful views up the mountains towards the monasteries, which you can walk to. Um, I love this little church. This is the other side of it, um, just because it was so vertical. This tiny little church is like four stories high, um, built into the side of the cliff. And uh, looking up the mountains to the monasteries that will go by in a minute. Um, back in the town, there's um, this is no longer used as a covered market, but it's it's one of the old public markets um, that was uh, a very important local visiting place um, decades ago, and of course. No matter where you go, you're going to see donkeys. They're used not just by tourists, but as I said, by locals. So they carry supplies to the shops and restaurants. Although nowadays um, they've modernized a little bit. So this innovation allows people to use these hand-drawn carts. They're not really motorized and they don't make any noise. Um, they're just pulled by people power, but it's um, it's an additional way to carry a lot of stuff around without using a donkey. The donkeys even ride the um, ferries, although I'm not sure how much donkeys enjoy that. Um, it's not something I would think they'd be used to, but... Um, here's um, one of the local street markets selling fresh vegetables, fruits, uh, and a typical restaurant sign. 
and some more of the nice little streets to explore. I liked being there in the fall because um, either during the high season, like late June through early September is um, much hotter um, and much more crowded. Um, so I think uh, it's it's worth your while if you want to visit any of these places to to go in the shoulder season when the weather is not quite so um, baking um, and it's you're you're more likely to have uh, a little breathing room. When I was there in late October, early November, um, there were actually um, there were plenty of tourists that felt very festive and nice, but certainly not crowded, um, and it was no. Uh, you didn't have any trouble walking through the streets or getting uh, getting into restaurants and shops and so forth. Um, let's take one last walk. Um, I walked up into the mountains, uh, heading up east because I wanted to see the monastery. So here's another gorgeous view looking back down the town from the opposite side. Um, and there's some good hiking trails that take you up to the monasteries. This is um, St. Nicholas. And off, way up off in the distance is another one. Unfortunately, both of these were closed when I was there. And again, these these particular monasteries have only nuns in right now, and I don't know how many, but uh, very few, uh, no doubt. Note these very traditional Ithari jugs. Um, these could be new or they could be ancient, but um, you can still buy reproductions of them now to put in your garden. These are traditional clay jugs that would have been used in ancient Greece to store, oh, any number of things, olives, olive oil, uh, wine, water, things like that, to keep them, particularly to keep things cool. Um, another view of the monastery from looking back at. It. The, the other monastery um, was also closed. Um, but this is on the way to the highest point in the island, which is called um, Prophetus Elias. Basically, almost any tall mountain in Greece will be named for the prophet Elias for some reason. There's really nothing to do here but enjoy the views and just breathe. <laughs> it's incredibly peaceful. Um, I don't think I encountered more than three other hikers on this on this path um, this is looking towards the more wild and inaccessible south side of here which really there are some very ambitious hikes like multi-mile hikes that you can take um, that are really very strenuous um, or probably an easier way if you want to explore this part of the island is to hire a boat um, to take you around because it's pretty inaccessible otherwise but if you want to go swimming, fishing, diving, um, there's no shortage of um, higher boats that, that can take you there. Um, and again, the views of the monasteries that I couldn't get into. And approaching the town again. I met this amazing cat. I think this is the most beautiful cat. I'm not actually a cat person. I'm more of a dog person. Um, but you can't help like the cats in Greece because they're everywhere. And this one was just, I loved her face. Um, on the very last night that I was there, I spent, I think, three days on either, which is more than enough, I think, um, to do some exploring and um, get a general feel for the island. Um, I clambered up to the highest point over the town where there's a ruined windmill. And it's a beautiful place to see the sunset, although you have to do a little bit of clambering, um, which makes it, once the sun's gone down and it gets dark, it makes it a little bit harder to get down. <laughs> but it was still worth it. Um, from up top, you can see these restored windmills that are down at the entrance to the harbor. Um, they're known now for Sophia Loren, the actress, because... Um, in 1957, they were used in a film that um, that she filmed here on the island called Boy on a Dolphin, which starred Clifton Webb and Alan Land and others. Um, so because these featured prominently in the film, they're now, um, the name is associated with her. 
And um, as the sun goes down, you just get a beautiful late afternoon, warm view. Um, as the sun turns the rocks, beautiful colors and lights up the roofs. And then the sunset is just magical. Everyone goes to Santorini to see the sunset. And I suppose you have to, um, because it is really one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Um, but I think it's a shame that people focus only on that because there are so many places in Greece, particularly in the islands, where you can get an equally magical sunset view um, without having to fight your way through crowds and crowds of um, visitors. So I will end the program there. And now I'm gonna unshare my screen and go back to the chat to just take a look at any questions we might um, have visited uh, or have that I have missed. Let's see, uh, let me do the chat first. Um, oh, there's lots of them, let's see. Why does Greece have so many churches? Um, well, it's a very religious country. And so uh, the, I, I don't know the percentage, but it's certainly probably 95% or more of the population is Greek Orthodox. Um, not everybody is as observant as in past generations, but still um, Greece is very family oriented, very religious, and certainly was in the past as well. Um, so in a lot of the small towns, um, towns that are now very small, uh, the village where our house is um, has only about 30 or 40 permanent residents now, um, but it had over 25 churches in it, um, many of which, some of which are in ruins and some of which are, are still there. Why would you have that many um, in such a small town? Because 200 years ago, um, our tiny little village had several hundred people in it. And that's true of a number of uh, places throughout Greece. Many of the places I'm showing you now um, in past centuries were much more populated than they are now. And it was common then, and even to some degree today, for each neighborhood, however small, to have its own church. It wouldn't necessarily be a huge church. It could be a chapel that was no bigger than your bathroom, um, but each family, each church, uh, each neighborhood had its own little uh, place to worship. Um, and so the, the legacy of that is that there are literally thousands of chapels all over Greece. Some are in villages, some are outside the villages. Um, it's, um, it's, it's just very common. And it's a joy in Greece to me because you can be hiking almost anywhere and stumble upon a church. Um, a couple of people have uh, mentioned how much they love the goats. Thank you. I love goats too. Um, is tourism the main source of income? On these two islands, I would guess yes. Um, it, it varies um, in different parts. Certainly agriculture is still important, um, although uh, obviously not large scale agriculture. Um, and there's a certain amount of manufacturing in different parts of Greece, but on the islands, um, the particularly the two that I've showed you today, um, definitely tourism is a major um, part of the economy. Um, and that's uh, all the ancillary things too, uh, not just hotels, but also restaurants and shops and taxi drivers and all the kinds of uh, other things that and food delivery and things that support tourism. Um, our family is considering visiting Greece in late June and early July. Um, what are the weather and crowds like then? I wouldn't go much later than that unless you like crowds. And um, there, um, there are the weather at that time will start to be hot. Um, it'll definitely be good swimming weather. The hottest times of Greece are late July and into August, um, where even without the kind of um, heat wave that they had this summer, um, I was there last month and it was easily in like 95 much of the time that I was there. Um, 
June and Ju June and early July are going to be hot, but not as hot. So I think I think you'll be fine. Um, it's when the crowds start to build up. It's not as bad um, as again as as high season in July and August. Whether there are crowds is really going to depend on where you go. Um, parts of Greece are incredibly touristed, and parts of Greece you will have all to yourself. So it really depends on where you're going. Are you taking the cruise? Are you traveling independently? What part of Greece? Um, feel free to email me. Um, again, um, I'll put my email in the chat again. Um, so uh, I can maybe answer your question a little bit more specifically if I know some more details. Um, why are there so many churches? Why are they so isolated? Many of them are isolated. They are off elsewhere. Um, Part of the isolation comes from a long history of uh, monastic life where people were trying to get away um, or where um, churches were built outside of the village um, just for for spiritual reasons because it's there's something there is something very spiritual about being off in nature and having um uh, like a pilgrimage site to go to. Um, is there any idea or photo of where Leonard? Uh, ah, yes, Leonard Cohen did have does have a house. Uh, did have a house on, on either, and um, I went by it. Um, I didn't visit it. Um, if you're a big Leonard Cohen fan, um, that's probably worth seeking out. Um, is there a rainy season? Mm, winter. <laughs> um, during the summer. Um, you will encounter very little rain, except maybe an occasional quick storm for an hour or so. Um, during the during the winter months, Greece probably gets most of its rain between November and March, and you're unlikely to travel there then. It's just it's not a time when people are mostly like most likely to go to Greece, um, not just because of the weather, but a lot of stuff closes, particularly in out of the way areas um many hotels and restaurants and shops shut down for the season um, because there's just not that many tourists so i think you can safely travel between um late march and mid-november that maybe thanksgiving um and you'd be fine but um the rest of the year i i don't think is, a, is the best time to to go to greece um thank you for the presentation um, I am, someone mentioned Instagram. I am on Instagram, just as Jeff Clapes, and feel free to follow me. I do post um, a lot of, a lot of my Instagram photos are more travel oriented. So do feel free to follow me there. Um, how is it, how easy it, is it to navigate without a knowledge of Greek? Very. Um, Greece actually is one of the, of all the European countries, Greece has one of the highest percentage of English speakers, um, and particularly if you are uh, traveling there in like going to mostly touristed places, um, you're going to encounter people and certainly anyone under the age of like 50 has probably studied at least some English in school um, and knows at least enough tourist English. Um, bear in mind, again, Greece is an incredibly popular tourist destination for the whole world. So they have people coming from all different countries and English is the lingua franca for, um, you know, if, if someone from Norway goes to Greece on vacation, they probably can't speak each other's languages, but they probably both know enough English to get by. So English, fortunately for those of us for whom it's a native language, English is a, um, yeah, you'll find um, English very widely spoken. Uh, except in the tiniest little villages. Um, but my recommendation is always to learn at least some Greek. I would make a point to learn the Greek alphabet, if nothing else, that's not that hard. Um, and learn basic phrases like, hello, thank you, please. Um, another thing that, a uh, phrase that I think you should always learn is in any language to a foreign country is learn how to say your country, village, house, town, is very beautiful and that opens all kinds of doors <laughs> people are always proud of where they're from and if you can compliment them in some way 
um, in their native language. It's a great way to break the ice, um, even if you don't, um, even if you can't go much further than that. Um, stupid question. What is the origin of whitewashed architecture in Greece? Oh, that's not a stupid question at all. Um, particularly on the islands, um, it's, I'm not sure about the history of it. Um, certainly one very big advantage to um, whitewashed buildings in a hot climate is they reflect heat and sun. Um, doesn't it require frequent cleaning? No, it requires frequent redoing. Um, you don't really clean a whitewashed house. You just put another coat of whitewash on it. Um, and that's, that's pretty common. Um, very much so in the south of Greece and in the Cycladic Islands and, and that area because those are the hottest parts of Greece. Um, if you travel in other parts of Greece, um, you won't see any whitewashed houses at all. Um, the part where our house is, almost all the buildings are stone, local stone. Um, they are not stuccoed, they are not whitewashed. Um, so the maintenance is minimal, but it, a lot of it has to do with the uh, the historical tradition of the architecture in those places. And a lot of that has to do with the historical um, uh, building materials in each place. Um, when you get up north, you'll find much more Ottoman inspired architecture um, that looks more Turkish, um, tends to be um, uh, stuccoed, but with wood beams, which you would never see in the Kikladis. Um in the Mani, where my house is, it's all local stone, but not whitewashed. It just depends. Um, just like here in America, there are different architectural styles, depending on the part of the country. Um, um, where can you find a schedule of my travel programs? I don't actually, I, I do try to promote them on my Facebook and Instagram pages, but because they're for, they tend to be for different libraries, so um, on my list of things to do this year is to try and find a better way to promote things for people who are coming from lots of different locations. Um, I will try to send something out. Um, the, the libraries that I do the most uh, programs for are Chelmsford and Tewksbury. Um, so if you follow them, you're probably going to get uh, most, but I will try and figure out a way that I can um get that information out to a broader audience um and as for uh, previous ones if you visit the wakefield library's um youtube page youtube channel um i have about 10 or 15 uh, of my programs recorded there um by no means all of them but it's a selection um and if you just go to uh the wakefield library uh, uh, wakefieldlibrary.org, or if you just search for Wakefield Library on YouTube, you'll find uh, the channel, and that's where most of the recorded ones live. Jeff, there... if, Jeff if I can interrupt for a second. Um, sure. So Jeff will be speaking to the Chumsford and Tewksbury Libraries next on Thursday, September 14th. I think we're going to the Middle East, Jeff. Uh, Omen, am I, am I pronouncing we're, we're going, correctly? Yes, um, that's for, yeah, for Chelmsford. Um, we're going to Oman, which is in the, on the, it's just south of um, Dubai and the uh, Arab Emirates. Great. Um, what, uh, is there any light life? In Idra, there's a little bit of night life. Um, on Kithra, no. <laughs> Kithra is not a nightlife place. It's where you want to go to escape. Idra is much more touristy. It doesn't have like, it isn't Mykonos, so it's not, it doesn't have lots of big dance clubs and wild stuff like that. But there's, um, it's it's definitely a busier place to go at night. Um, da -da -da, the mountain behind Jeff, my screensaver looks like, oh, I'll talk about that in just one sec. Um, that is actually the view from my porch in uh at my house in Greece. So I'll talk about that in a second because I saw another question about that. What should I wear to tour um, and what to wear for dinner? Greece is pretty casual. Like unless you're going to a really, really high-end restaurant like in Athens, Greece is pretty casual um, for clothing. 
Um, and it's hot when you're there in the summer. So wear comfortable clothes. If you want to go hiking, definitely take um, take appropriate shoes uh, for hiking. Um, you don't want to be doing the kind of walks I did wearing flip-flops. Um, but other than that, Greece is not a particularly, um, it's not like going to the south of France <laughs> where you're expected to dress up to go to dinner. It's a much more relaxed kind of place. Um, I think, da, 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 da. okay, and I'm going to quickly check the q and I, I want to make sure I don't miss any questions. Um, have I traveled to Cyprus? No, um, it is certainly on my list. Um, I would love to go to Cyprus. Um, and when I do, I'll do a program on it, I assure you. Tell us more about our house in Greece. How much time do I spend there? Um, we bought a house. Uh, it's an old stone house uh, built in the mid-19th century in a very small village called Lagia, which is in the southern part of the Mani Peninsula, the middle of the three peninsulas. Um, it's very far south. We're almost at the southern tip. Um, and it's a lovely village that has nothing in it except a church and a taverna and a lot of beautiful scenery. So um, we go there to escape and get away. Um, and the, the Zoom background that you can see behind me is the view from the roof terrace where I sit with a book and a glass of ouzo. Um, I will. I was there last month, and I'll be going back in October. Um, I try to go at least three, maybe four times a year. Now that I'm retired, I can go more frequently. Um, and a nice thing about being there is that once you're there, you can. Um, it makes it much easier to visit other parts of Greece that I've always wanted to go to because once you're there, it's it may only be an hour or two to get to some other part. Um, someone asked about getting around the island. Um, uh, for Kithara, yes, um, we have a we always have a rental car when we're there because we're in the middle of nowhere. You have to have a car. Um, so I think I already talked about this a little bit. Um, yes, you definitely want a car on Kithara. Um, the curved roofs um, on Kithara, the the curved roofs are usually. Um, they often have a wood frame, at least if it's an old building, it will have some sort of wood framed um, structure underneath. And then most of it is uh, stone and stucco on top. And then a few buildings will have slate tiles put on top of it um, or just the stucco. Um, what faiths are being practiced? Um, as I said, the overwhelming majority is Greek Orthodox. Um, very little other than that. Um, uh, the most common language used is Greek. Um, and yes, um, I would not worry about traveling with English. You can definitely make do with English. Um, but as I said, um, please uh, make a point to try to learn a little bit of basic phrases just because it's a way of being friendly and courteous to the locals. Um, and so few people know Greek that if you know even a few words of Greek, People will love you. Um, someone saw the map with Euclidus view point on it. How is it associated with the famous mathematician? I don't know. Um, I would have to look that up and get back to you. Um, I will take a look after we close and I'll send the answer to um, Robert who can include it in his email. Um, do they have horses on either? Uh, yes, I saw a few horses, but basically, if you're trying to get around the town, um, it's exclusively donkeys because horses are kind of too big. Um, but off, off in the landscape, there were there were horses. Um, if you're overweight and don't navigate tons of staircases, but can do long walks at a slower clip, is this area difficult? No. Um, a, a lot of the places that I showed you today are um, things that you can kind of do on your own pace. Um, Either in particular, the town, yeah, it's got lots of staircases. You can take a donkey if you want, or just take your time. There's no rush. Um, as I think the biggest thing would be if you have knee problems, because a lot of it is going up and down stairs. Um, but um, if, you're, if you're reasonably in shape, you'd be fine. 
if you are wheelchair bound or have serious mobility issues, Greece is not all that accessible. Um, they've made some progress, but not a whole lot, um, particularly when you get out of um, out of the area, uh, like in Athens and the big cities and so forth. There's a lot of cobblestones. There's a lot of staircases. So, um, but if you're at least reasonably in shape. Take water with you and um, take your time and you'll be fine. Um, yes, there are English speakers. Uh, I already mentioned Leonard Cohen's house. Yes, if you're a Leonard Cohen house, definitely uh, visit it. I did not, but it's worth it. Yes, the churches are all Greek Orthodox. Oh, I think I read these already. Um, are there options for those who cannot do those kinds of hikes, such as like to get to the top of the monastery? It depends. Um, some of the monasteries um, are accessible by car. Like you can, you can either take the hike or you can take a car. Um, if you're willing, you can take a donkey. <laughs> Sometimes that's an option as well. Um, but it really depends on the particular one. Idra, because Idra does not have um, vehicles. Uh, motorized vehicles, either is a little bit more difficult. Um, but in plenty of other places in Greece, um, you can, uh, the, the monastery at the top of the mountain, you can just as easily drive up to. Um, it really just totally depends on where you are. Uh, what happens to the monasteries when there's no monks left? Um, are they repurposed, left to go to ruin? Um, I've seen both. There are definitely lots of ruined monasteries. There are also monasteries that have no monks left in them, but they are still maintained by the community or the larger church. There's even a monastery not far from our house where um, it was actually purchased by a private family who is restoring it um, as a, a place to visit, um, but it is no longer owned by the church. So there's there's a variety of different things but yeah like who knows 100 years from now there may not be any monks it's not really a it's not a hot career move these days um english if you can go for a few to only a few islands which would you choose um again uh you might want to email me separately I could talk to you about that. It really depends on what you like. Um, the, the two most popular islands anywhere in Greece are Mykonos and Santorini. Um, to my way of thinking, Mykonos is entirely missable <laughs> um, because it's way over touristed. Um, and although it's very pretty, um, I think there are a number of other islands in the Kikladis that are just as pretty without all tourists. Um, the main advantage to going to Mykonos is that it's the easiest way to get to Delos. Uh, Delos is the, the, the historic island that is, it's uninhabited now. It's, it's exclusively an archaeological site, and it's one of the best in Greece. Um, so uh, Mykonos is the easiest way to get there. Um, uh, everybody goes to Santorini, and I've, I've been twice. It is as beautiful as they say it is. Um, but with the huge number of cruise ships, it's really getting over touristed. So if you go to Santorini, and I would at least once, it, it's unbelievably gorgeous. Um, go as off season as you can. Go in April, go in November. It'll still be beautiful and it will be far less busy and you'll have a nicer time. Um, and also uh, go for more than a day. Like the cruise ships always stop there and give you just long enough to go up and have dinner and uh, go through all the shops, spend more time on the island because Santorini has way more to offer than just that picture perfect view. Um, there's an amazing historic um, archaeological site there. There are some other villages that are beautiful. There's some gorgeous beaches. And those are very often missed by people who stop on cruise ships and only have a few hours. So um, that would be my advice. Um, as for other islands, like I said, uh, Greece has of Greece's 6,000 islands, I think 200 of them are inhabited and visitable. So, but they're all different. Every one of them has a different personality. So it depends on whether you want 
peace and quiet. It depends on whether you want beaches or shopping or nightlife or hiking or uh, historic sites. Um, you really kind of have to think about what what interests you. Um, so if you have that kind of question, um, email me. I'm going to put my put my email back in. Um, so yeah, if you have specific questions about traveling there, feel free to email me privately, and I can probably give you better um, better advice. How much time a year do you get to spend? I think I said I try to go at least three times a year um, for you know at least two or three weeks at a time. Uh, air conditioning is less common in all of Europe than it is in the US, but it's getting more common. And if you stay in uh, if you stay in a, a higher end hotel, you're more likely to get it. But even now, um, it may not be as freezing as it is in the US, but they often have those little um, wall units um, uh, that will at least take the edge off um, if you're there when it's really hot. Um, someone asked about animal rights groups spaying the cats. I know nothing about that. That's another thing I would have to um, find out. There, there's definitely a lot of stray cats um, all over Greece. Um, lots of questions. Yeah, Jeff, I'm going to go and mark the questions you've already answered. I think you have about five or six left. Okay. Um, don't feel obligated to get to them all. I know we're about almost uh, an hour and 45 minutes in, but if you want to answer a few more, that'd be great. Sure. I'm, let me work up from the bottom. Uh, with all the donkeys on the main streets, how do they keep it clean? They don't always. <laughs> you, you might be stepping on dry donkey poop, um, and that's just life. Have I been to Sifnos? Um, yes, I have. It's beautiful. I love Sifnos. Um, being mostly a church, is it is um, is Greece gay friendly? It it depends on where you are. My husband and I have a house in Greece, in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere, and they're fine. Like a lot of it is just, you know, um, Athens and Thessaloniki have big gay communities, and there are certainly some of the more touristy places. Mykonos, in particular, um, has a big gay uh, life. It's kind of like a lot of other places. It's it is more. It's a it's a conservative country in many ways, but um, I've never really found a lot of trouble traveling there. Um, but it can depend on where you are, and certainly being in rural, out of the way places is different from being in the city. Um, are there small animals and snakes? Yes, there's snakes. Greeks are petrified of snakes for some reason. Um, I've rarely seen snakes, and when I do, they they quickly go out of the way because they're more afraid of you than you are of them. But I have found it interesting that all of my Greek friends are petrified of snakes and are always worried when I go off hiking that I'm supposed to be careful of snakes. Um, there's uh, for other animals, you're other you're not likely to see much um, unless you're way in the mountains like off the beaten path. Um, Greece does not have a good train system. That's true. Um, I would say, yes, car. Um, if, you, if you are trying to travel independently, car is renting a car is definitely the best way to get around. Driving in Greece is actually, I find it a delight. Um, it's not as scary as you might think it is. Um, if you can drive in Boston, you can certainly drive in Greece. Um, there's not a lot of traffic once you get out of the cities, and it's beautiful countryside. If you've driven anywhere else in Europe, I don't think you'd find Greece a problem. Um, uh, is most of the food imported? Um, Greece has uh, Greece makes a lot of its own food. It has um, its growing season is very long. It has delicious um, meats and fruits and vegetables. Olives are grown. Um, or olive oil. 
Um, yes, there's a lot of local stuff. Uh, most places will have a, um, uh, like Yagara, I'm trying to think of the English word farmer's market. Um, and um, you can get all kinds of local products, um, cheeses. Greeks are very proud of their cuisine and much of it is local um, and seasonal. If you like the whole farm to table concept, Greece is a great country because that's the way they tend to cook, um, depending on what's seasonal and available and what is typical for the local area. Each area has its own special recipes and specialties. Um, October, somebody's going in October. That's a wonderful time to go. Um, spring and fall are definitely the best times there. Um, absolutely. And how should you dress? Um, as I said, Greece is pretty casual. If you want to go hiking, take appropriate shoes. Um, make sure you take sunblock because it's even or buy it once you're there because you know, it's definitely um, sunny even in those times. And yes, you can swim. Um, depending on what your tolerance for, um, you know, I'm, I'm here in New England and even in August, the water's freezing cold. Um, so Greece is a delight because you can go swimming even into November. Um, I've, I've been swimming in, in our area. It's chilly, but even in November or April, you can go swim. Mm. Um, medical care for visitors, that's a big question. Um, and it depends on your circumstances. I would, if, if you have medical conditions that worry you when traveling, I would definitely look into travel insurance that, um, that would cover any of your concerns. But Greece has a pretty decent uh, uh, national medical system and you can get care even as a foreigner, um, you can get emergency care there if need be but um if you have any specific uh conditions that that are a problem for you um, it's always a good idea to investigate uh, travel insurance that would cover that kind of thing um i already said what time to visit is good spring and fall um, i don't have a website but i do have um, instagram um, which is just at jeff Clapes. so uh, feel free to um, follow me on Instagram. Um, I think, is that all of them? I think, Jeff, I'm good if you're good. I just put your Instagram in the chat, okay. um, which was someone's uh, request. So, um, yeah, I think you legitimately answered about 45 questions <laughs> between the Q&A and the chat. Okay. Yeah. So that was very thorough. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Let's give Jeff a big virtual round of applause for another wonderful presentation Look for an email for me tomorrow with a recording, feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming armchair travel presentations. Uh, Jeff, do you have any last words before we wrap it up? Um, go to Greece. <laughs> if, you, if you're in my neck of the woods, let me know. You can visit our village. Um, and as I said, um, I know a lot of you have questions that I might not have answered. Do feel free to um, email me directly. I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can. Um, I'm not a native of Greece, but I've traveled there many times, and um, so I can hopefully, if, and plus I was a librarian, so if I don't know the answer, I can find out. Um, so uh, don't be shy about um, contacting me if you have any other things that you want to know. And I hope I'll see you at our next program, which I forget the date, but uh, Robert will include it in the details, uh, when we'll be traveling to Oman in Arabia, which is one of my favorite countries. Okay. And nobody goes there. So I hope you'll right. join me for that. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Looking forward to that next month. And we'll be in touch regarding the rest of the fall. Uh, so I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Uh, I think the rain's going to stop hopefully soon, if not uh, already. And I yeah. hope uh, everyone has a great night. Thanks again. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Bye.